Well, I'm delighted to be here, and I think this is an absolutely fantastic conference. I suspect that some of what I'll be saying you've heard already about five times from other speakers, but not to worry. I will touch on the City of London, but really my main interest, of course, is what's going to happen to the economy more generally. And before going on to what I see as the post-Brexit situation, I'd just like to say something about the resilience of the economy to date because I think it tells you about the resilience of the, of the economy going forward into the next two, three, four, ten years. I remember only too well prior to the vote how uh, the Treasury and the Bank of England and the IMF and Uncle Tom Cobbley and all were saying that we'd have a recession if we had the temerity to vote to leave the EU. Suffice to say, it didn't put me off voting to leave the EU, but there we go. Um, I have to say this, and I'm trying not to gloat too much. I was one of the few economists who said, come on, come on. If there's a vote, of course the markets will react and have a fit of hysterics, because that's what markets do. And I'm, I'm sure that David there is nodding vigorously, but I've done my share of sitting in financial markets, and I know that dealers absolutely love a crisis because it means they can make lots of money. <laughs> and... Uh, I remember doing a radio uh, program soon after uh, the, the vote, and John Humphrey says, oh, markets hate uncertainty. I said, you have to be joking. They love it. It's called bonus time. <laughs> but there we go. I'm just an old cynic. But I think <laughs> the point is that the economy has done it. The markets did settle down very well. OK, the pound has weakened, but that is actually, as far as I'm concerned, uh, um, more, helpful than a, more of a help than a hindrance because the pound was overvalued. And uh, as for the economy itself, it's just sort of chugged along 0.6% growth in the second quarter, 0.6% growth in the third quarter, 0.7% growth in the fourth quarter, and so on and so forth. And what is interesting, that the Bank of England, who massively had to downgrade its forecasts in August in order to justify, of course, its monetary easing package, remember that one? Interest rates were cut to 0.25%, and of course we had more quantitative easing, thank you very much. Um, but since then, they've had to upgrade their forecasts at least twice. And Andy Haldane, who's the chief economist of the Bank of England, said, well, you know, we didn't quite get it right. It's a fair cop. Gov. I mean, I mean, this man is the chief economist of the Bank of England, for goodness sake. And he's talking about being a fair cop, that they got it wrong. Well, don't take me there, because I'm going to have one of my fits. But there we go. But he's, he's actually not good enough. And of course, the OBR, and I'm not so critical of the, critical of the OBR, because I think they were trying to do a, a fair job. But at the time of the autumn statement, they did actually downgrade growth quite considerably for 2017. And all I can say is watch this space next week, 8th of March, I hope you, ha you have it in your diary. There is the budget, and the OBR, I have little doubt, will upgrade their forecast for 2017. So far, I hope so good. But what are the economy going forward over the next two or three years? Well, Andy Haldane, and I quote him again, because he's irresistible as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> he said, well, actually, he was asked the Treasury Select Committee, you know, what would happen to the economy in the run-up to Brexit over the next couple of years, and then the final year. And the bank's forecasts only go three years ahead, so after that it was uh, into no man's land, so to speak. And he said, well, I don't think there'll be any material impact on the economy of, of, of Brexit. So there. You have it from the horse's mouth, or whatever. And indeed, I would expect the economy to continue very much as it would have done otherwise, although, of course, we'll never know the counterfactual. I've just mentioned the fact that the pound has weakened. That will give a boost to exports. On the other hand, of course, it is pushing up inflation. Inflation was 1.8% in January. Mind you, it was 2% in February in the, in the Eurozone, so you, you take your pick. And that will put a squeeze on consumption, I have little doubt. So it'll be swings and roundabouts. But I'm, I'm reasonably optimistic the economy will continue to thrive. <coughs> of course, it may slow down. But it may slow down because basically the recovery is getting pretty mature. And when recoveries get mature and unemployment falls below 5% as it is now, that's when economies, unless there's some huge boost to productivity, that's when economies do tend to slow down. But you can bet your bottom dollar if there is a slowdown in the economy, people go, Brexit! <laughs> I've, I've got my, my sort of card ready, but, but beware, beware. Uh, I know people only too well. I am a cynic, you know. I'm a shocking cynic. 
Now, that's enough of where we are and where we will be over the next two years. But what will happen when we actually leave? Well, I am, as you've gathered, an optimist. But to some extent, it will depend on the nature of our relationship with the European Union. Of course it will. And we already know roughly what that relationship is going to be. We are going to be out of the single market because Theresa Mayo, who, by the way, I think is doing a fantastic job. I'm absolutely here. One hundred percent. <laughs> um, and she, she's having quite a lot of provocation, if I may say so, from various Lib Dems who are going to have their beds in the House of Lords next week so they can get up and vote. But uh, she has made it very clear we're out of the single market because she wants to control the borders. She is absolutely right. And indeed, the single market, I don't know why people think it's such a wonderful thing. As far as I'm concerned, and I remember using this phrase about 10 years ago, it's the boa constrictor of economic models because it's all about regulation, heavy regulation that you can't do anything about. And indeed, the, the government itself has said that the single market outside possibly financial services, within services, barely exists. So what's the big deal? So we'll be out of the single market. We'll be out of the customs union. And as uh, James has rightly said, that means that we'll be able to cut our tariffs. And that won't just help developing countries' exporters, but it will help people here as well, because if you're cutting your tariffs on food and things like clothing and footwear, which have quite high tariffs on them, that will be a boost to people's incomes here, post-Brexit, and that will be disproportion disproportionately advantageous to the lower income groups. So there's a real, real, real possibility there of an advantage of being able to cut tariffs. Um, and, of course, the big thing from my perspective is that you'll be able to then have your own trade deals and negotiate your own trade deals, which we can't do at the moment as a member of a customs union. And I'm wholly with James in saying that one of our priorities should be the Commonwealth countries, because not just for cultural ties, but because economically they are very important countries. And I felt for a very long time the Commonwealth has been a very neglected resource. And what else has uh, Theresa May said? Well, she said, um, we'll try and get a bespoke deal, you know, the best deal for Britain. And she's right to try and negotiate a, a bespoke deal for Britain. Uh, and basically, I think there are two things that really matter. One is the continuation of tariff-free trade, if possible, with the European Union under some sort of free trade agreement. And I think the second thing is something for the city. Um, the city is an important part of the British economy, but don't let's get too carried away by it. It's what, what two and a half percent of GDP or whatever, but it's important. I'm not, dec I'm not decrying it. Please believe me, I'm not decrying it. And at the moment, there is something called the passport, which means that if a bank registers with a regulatory authority here, it can trade right throughout the EU, or the EEA rather, uh, without any restrictions. Uh, that will go because we will leave the single market. But I think the plan will be to have some sort of uh, bilateral deal between the UK and the EU so that financial services can continue with as little impediment as possible possibly based on something like regulatory equivalence, but that, that we will wait and we will have to find out, we will have to wait and find out what they, what they eventually manage to negotiate. And I think the final thing to say about what relationship we will have is that Theresa May has made it very clear, and I totally agree with her, that if it's all is on the table is a bad deal, then no deal is better than a bad deal. Yeah, yeah. And if she walks away from it and say, I'm sorry, guys, you know, this is really not good enough, uh, then I, that's, 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 that's absolutely the, the correct stance to take when she's going into the negotiating room with the EU. Now, as far as I'm concerned, with this bespoke deal that I've talked about, if our EU partners are economically rational, they'll sign on the dotted line straight away because after all they have a whacking great trade uh, surplus with us uh, in goods. It was 90 billion last year, which is quite a few folks bargains when you think about it. And indeed, when it comes to financial services, Mark, uh, Barnier, who's the chief EU chief negotiator, has said, if there is impediment to trade, financial services trade between the city and the European Union, actually people in the European Union could be more damaged by that than the city itself. 
So he acknowledges that, in fact, the city is a very important service for a lot of our customers and corporates and governments within the EU. But, of course, I made a very big if, capital letters IF, if they're economically rational, you cannot guarantee it because you don't know how the politics are going to work. And I leave that to you to think about. Um, we, but we will find out. We will find out. And if it does happen, there's no deal, is, no proper deal is negotiated, and we do walk away, then, of course, we will be trading under WTO rules, the World Trade Organization rules, which are not a catastrophe, whatever the CBI has been saying this week. You know, this is not a catastrophe. And indeed, if you look at trade with uh, countries like uh, that are outside the EU, our trade over the last 10 years has grown faster with non-EU countries than with EU countries. It has grown 75% over the last decade with non-EU countries. It's grown 25% with EU countries. And what does that tell you? It tells you that commercial reality and growth prospects are much more important to trade. That is, the, those are the drivers of trade rather than actually being in a specific preferential trade agreement. Yes, let's have a preferential trade agreement if we can get one, but it is not a disaster if there isn't one. Trade under WTO rules is perfectly feasible. Now, going on very quickly on, Article 50, we trust, will be invoked by the end of March, whatever their noble lordships decide to do over the next couple of weeks. And I think there are two or three things to say about that. Obviously, Article 50 is mainly about uh, the divorce proceedings, you know, where the EU citizens write, whether they have rights here and vice versa and all this palaver. But there is something in Article 50 which talks about uh, the framework of the new relationship. And if you look at the EU white paper uh, that came out, I think, at the beginning of in February sometime, it did say that we're hoping to have some agreement on the relationship uh, within the two years. Well, that may prove to be too optimistic, but I think uh, David Davis is quite right to enter into these talks with optimism and determination and being positive. I think he's absolutely right in what he's doing. And I know people keep asking me, do you think David's the right person to do this job? And I say, yes, he's got that sort of look of battered resilience, which means he does not give way easily. And if something goes wrong, he always manages to laugh it off, which is absolutely essential if he's going to be dealing with Brussels. But there we go. <laughs> Um, and, of course, I mean, the, the, the final thing to say about Article 50 is that um, it does look, you know, we know it's within a two-year framework, and basically we know we're going to be out of the EU by March 2019. And that'll be when the Great Repeal Bill is introduced, which repeals the 1972 European Communities Act. Do you know, I remember it well because I'm so ancient. And I was, I was working in the Treasury at the time. And I, I remember why we joined the EU, or the EEC as it was then, is because basically this country lost its way. And we, we just, the morale was just dreadful. And we sort of saw the EEC as something that would raise us uh, up. And of course, it's um, as far as I'm concerned, pretty well just the opposite, but there we are. But the 1972 Act will re be repealed, and all the uh, outstanding EU legislation will be absorbed into British law, which makes an awful lot of sense, but somebody's going to be terribly busy, that's all I can say. Well, what happens when we're out? As I say, it does depend to some extent on the relationship, but not crucially, quite honestly. That's my genuine view. And I think we're going to be in a terrific position to, ha to really have a major competitiveness boost to the British economy. I really am genuinely optimistic. And uh, I think the first thing, of course, we can talk about, talk about repealing <laughs> or amending some of the most irksome regulations that business finds so infuriating. And when we do, we'll have these trade agreements that we've dis discussed several times already. Uh, we will have, a, I think, a bespoke immigration policy. I, I know you're going to have somebody else talking about immigration, but an immigration policy that is more suited to the social and economic needs of this country, which I think is absolutely right. And we will save some money on our contributions, which are rising to 10 billion a year. Well, I'm quite happy to accept 10 billion a year. Thank you very much. So all those things, provided they're well managed by the governments of the future, 
And who knows, if Jeremy Corbyn wins the 2020 election, all bets are off as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but, and by the way, I should be voting Conservative just in case you don't realise. Uh, <laughs> but um, I'm, not, I'm not wearing this colour blazer for nothing. Um, <laughs> Well, it's the only one I've got, actually, but never mind. Uh, oh, blue suits me, but um, blue suits us all. But provided there is a government there that really wants to take advantage of the new freedoms, boy, I'm optimistic. And I think, too, especially picking up something on something that James was saying, that the Commonwealth countries are countries that are going to grow fast. And... Being outside the EU, we will be able to, to refocus our trading relationships even more so than we are doing already towards the fast-growing countries of the world. That will help this country. Do you know, why didn't we do this before? <laughs> <laughs>